Uh, before we get started, I want to uh, first acknowledge the land that we're on, uh, Nadakina. Uh, this is unceded Abenaki land. Um, uh, you all have the the um, book or the program or, or both. So uh, this piece actually, for for me, um, writing this piece was about engaging in a practice of listening uh, as a way of coming into a relationship to place um, and uh, the place where I live and uh, sort of my my presence within it. And, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that it is uh, that it is unceded Abenaki land and that I'm a settler person uh, living on it. Um, so those themes come up uh, throughout, throughout the piece. Um, my plan for right now, uh, I'm going to, first I want to acknowledge uh, a lot of people without whom this would not have been possible. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the piece and then, uh, and then we're going to perform it for you. Uh, so um, to, to start out, um, I want to thank uh, my partner Sasha and uh, Emmett and Baird who are here somewhere in my family um, uh, for their support in, in all of this. I um, want to thank the uh, Vermont Arts Council. Uh, this is funded through a creation grant and would not have been possible without them. Um, I want to thank uh, Turn Music and Ann Decker and Steve Klamowski and Elizabeth Reed and uh, Jesse Metzler and Evan Primo um, and uh, who've just done a, a fantastic job working, working with the music. I want to thank, um, uh, I want to thank uh, Tobin Anderson for the continued uh, conversation and um, uh, throughout this whole process um, as well and uh, lots of other uh, folks um, who, have, who have also uh, informed this work. Um, so the piece, as you uh, might be able to see uh, from the score, a little bit uh, unconventional as a piece of music. Um, at, because it's a piece of music that, that is about listening, uh, that is about uh, trying, to, trying to locate with your ears uh, different sorts of conversations and relationships that exist uh, in the place around us. I would welcome people to, uh, during the performance, if you want to get up and move around a little bit, we've got acoustic instruments here, we've got uh, some sound coming through speakers. The sound is gonna sound different in every place. So you can move around to, to hear the sound differently. Um, the piece uh, starts out with um, some nail fiddles, um, which are, which are they should be called screw fiddles, but nail fiddle sounds better. Um, they're just boards with screws in them. Uh, the screws are tuned uh, and then bowed. Um, then the first uh, piece of sound uh, that you'll hear, uh, the first piece of uh, sound that, that I started with in composing it um, is the sound of water leaking through the dam at Robinson Sawmill up uh, at Kent Corners in uh, Callis. Um, and I was intrigued by this idea of uh, that, that that dam is still there uh, and that that water is and has been and continues to and is successfully overcoming the dam and that that dynamic has been going on for generations, um, even centuries. Uh, and so that trickle of water becomes a character throughout the piece. The first movement, uh, the instruments are sort of picking up um, musical motifs and threads that are uh, in that gurgling water. Um, the second movement uh, is um, based on the bell in the Old West Church, also up in Calais. Um, and... Uh, Let's see, what's my third movement? Um, the third movement uh, is the flange, right, okay. Uh, the also comes from East Callis um, 
and is the voice of Myra Daniels, whose folk songs were archived by Helen Hartness Flanders. And so that's a movement about um, what archiving is and what uh, it means to record a history, what it means to uh, remember a past into the present uh, and the, the responsibilities attached to that. Uh, then we talk about uh, Japanese knotweed and invasive species. Um, oh, another thank you to, uh, to Sean Clute, too, with whom I work in the Rural Noise Ensemble. Uh, and that uh, draws upon an installation that Sean and I did a couple years ago. Uh, but the question of uh, what an invasive species is and how I, as a member of a settler colonial culture, uh, relate to invasivity. Um, uh, what you'll hear as well there uh, is the theme of the water from that first movement comes back and is in counterpoint with the invasive species, right? Because the invasive species are actually growing uh, in this same water, this continuous water. Um, uh, from there, uh, we return to um, Helen Hartness Flanders and some of that motivic material to talk about uh, the Vermont Commission for Country Life, which was the commission that, um, that funded uh, Helen Hartness Flanders' ballad collection and was also a commission that came out of the Vermont Eugenics Project. So uh, in, the, in that chapter of the score, uh, it's dealing with that question of um, what are the politics behind uh, the, the creation of a narrative of, uh, of the rural? Um, and then we wind up actually in the garden house, which you can see the roof of uh, right up there, um, uh, with the question of haunting. Uh, and the, the, the legend of that garden house is that it was built with the timbers from the Ipswich courthouse where the, uh, where the Salem witches were condemned. And that the Martin family who lived on this land before it uh, became Goddard's campus uh, were descendants of Susanna Martin and uh, built the, um, the garden house up there with those timbers from that, uh, from that courthouse. Um, so, of course, campus lore is that it's super haunted. Um, and so uh, that piece um, actually deals with the sonic nature of that space itself. Um, so I just wanted to, I'll be honest with you. Can I be honest with you? Because, yeah. So, you know, not everyone is a contemporary music listener. Um, there are going to be sounds, uh, harmonies, uh, timbres, colors that um, might not be what what everybody here is used to used to listening while you're washing your dishes or whatever, um, and so uh, I I want us all to approach this act of listening and this act of engaging with sound uh, as something that is not just an entertainment, but that is also something of uh, of a ceremony of being in relationship to those sounds, knowing that those sounds are in relationship to the place that surrounds us. Um, so a way of listening and opening yourself up to listening and hearing how these things come together um, uh, as just one little window, one little glimpse uh, into being in relationship to place. Um, so thank you all so much for being in this place. Uh, together so that we can, uh, we can take part uh, in, in this conversation together. Uh, after the piece, um, I would love to circle up with whoever is interested in talking about our relationships to place, our relationships to history, to belonging, to haunting. I want to hear your ghost stories. I want to hear how you experience uh, the place where you live. Um, so uh, for anyone who wants to stay around afterwards, I would love to do some story sharing and some oral history. Um, but for the moment, without further ado, I would like to welcome Ann Decker. Uh, and here's
O'Donnell of the Hardwick, Vermont, now sings for the Flanders Ballad Collection, Newberry College, Newberry, Vermont. Now what's the name of it? The Land of Beginning Again. Uh, this was recorded July 1st, 1954. And where did you learn, Mr. Donnell? You learned it already? Really? No, it's a long time.
Um, let's see. So I'm not exactly sure how to facilitate this conversation, but I will tell you a couple things. Um, I want to hear your ghost stories, if anyone has ghost stories. Um, but I'm also just curious, uh, I mean, a question that I have for people is, how did you learn about the history of where you live? Through your neighbor? What did you learn about it? But, yeah, but, but I think that's super interesting, the way that, uh, you know, something that you bring up there about how you can see the history, you know what I mean, in the, in the shape of the building, probably also in the shape of the land around it, you know? Uh, what about for other folks? Where, how did you learn about um, the history of the place that you live? And now you've told me this. This is, doesn't have to do with the history of the place where you live, but uh, Andy is a descendant of Susanna Martin as well. And, and, and so is she. Yes, so I'm told. Yeah. Oh, wow. show <laughs> Who here isn't a descendant of Susanna? <laughs> I'm glad you could all make it. <laughs> Yeah. My brother came to Central Vermont to Elmore in 79. And when they arrived, they were farming and found a stone circle that's inlaid into the field. Mm -hmm. So they're just flattened in a circle. And they had no idea how it got there. So I'm wondering if that is a Abenaki descent. And it never. It doesn't get disrupted. It's still right there. You know, now and, I'm on that land well. and that's in the Elmore yeah, area? it's in Elmore. Interesting. In the Elmore Roots Nursery, and I'm at the top, and it's, it's just the most magical. Place. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's interesting. But you asked how we might know about... Yeah, how you learned about well, the I place where you live. I say it, but when I, I looked up one of the apps, yeah. To tell you what the history of your land or area might be, so that's kind of uh -huh. very generalized. But but now I've had just because of more awareness of Abenaki here in Central and Northern Vermont. Um, whenever I traverse into the back of my land or whatever, um, I have such a renewed regard and yearning to. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, I know one of the things that I always find, uh, to, something that I was interested in, uh, in, in this piece is the, the idea of boundaries and how boundaries are marked. Um, and one of the things that I'm always fascinated by are the um, piles of rusted metal that you find in the middle of the woods and the way that like every junk pile, you know, was a place where somebody drew the line between like this is the land I use and this is the land where I throw my stuff or because it's happened. or something but you often find like very specific like like clearly somebody <laughs> this was somebody's garbage heap you know and so it was just outside of wherever they drew the boundary of like the land that they considered useful to them um, and so in that way like there are all of these historical wow. markers of boundaries that may have just been the psychological boundary of somebody. You know what I mean? Um, but that are like permanently uh, uh, laced throughout all the woods and in places where you don't well, that even expect to find woods. them. It's my understanding that the bulk of, especially where I am in Elmore, it was not younger trees or woods or forest at all. It was meadow. It was pasture land. Yeah. So I'm thinking of an old car. It looks like an old like, 1940s vehicle that has bullet holes everywhere in it and I found it when I was 12 and then I raised my children on the same land again for 22 years and I tell the story of it was prohibition and this and it may very well have been <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, Guido and Carlos came you know they had a feud and you know they were running rum from Canada to Poughkeepsie or you know whatever and that's what went down and it's still there mm -hmm. in the middle wow. of the woods okay. in Elmore yes with okay. bullet holes <laughs> with bullet holes yeah I mean it was probably hunters I suppose <laughs> <laughs> my story is better I like your story the long credits to your story on yes. uh, the Waldorf School up on uh, Route 14 yeah at Grace Farm yeah um, that um well, it's where Gerald Hawkins used to farm. Mm -hmm. And um, my grandfather uh, lived next house down towards the Cape Farm at that point. Yep. And we got a knock on the door at 2 in the morning, so my grandfather goes down. And Gerald and Doc are all upset because uh, they'd just been robbed because they were storing bootleg hooch in the cellar in the house of the Waller School. <laughs> and, uh, and so... Um, they say, well, what, you, what you, you know, so my grandfather looks at him and says, so, what do you want me to do? You want me to call the police and tell them that you're a story booth like you right? <laughs> And they go, oh, yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> and so, I didn't, my children were raised in that school. For, oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't see any moonshine. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty magical piece of ground. Yeah, they were held yeah. up at gunpoint. Here on that, and wow. You know, other booth Back in, oh, in Prohibition <laughs> time. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So, Otto, I, um, with respect to place, yeah. since I was a little tadpole, I like walking rivers when there's water in them. Yeah. And I think that's my acquaintance to place and names. Yeah, yeah. Um, and something that that and bootlegging brings to mind for me um, <laughs> is the way that, like, so often we think about like places, like the things that are bounded, like a property, right? Um, but like the river as a pathway, as a thing that gets you between two places, you know, whether, whether it's yeah. in a boat or, or whether you're walking it. And that like bootlegging routes as well also like define place in a certain way in terms of like, oh, bye, Kathy. Um, in terms of like, being the route that gets you from one place to another. Um, there's uh, um, Lisa Brooks, who's uh, cited in the score, um, but who's an Abenaki scholar uh, in her book, The Common Pot. Um, she has maps of the Northeast where everything is removed except for the rivers. Um, and so it allows you to sort of see place differently because proximity isn't, in terms of like our roads, but in terms of what waterways connect different spots, 
Um, and so, yeah, and so it organizes space a little differently. Um, uh, three of the ways in this piece that I was thinking about boundary um, was one being like barriers, things that actually stop you from, from moving. Um, one being about like range, like the range of a bell. Uh, and there's, uh, uh, in, the, in the movement on bells, it talks about like how um, throughout the colonial world, like th throughout the process of colonization and Christian colonization, the range from which you could hear the church bell was considered like the, the land that had been civilized by the church, right? Okay. And so the, the, that oral range became a boundary marker. So, you know, thinking about ranges and uh, as, a way of, uh, as a way of thinking about place, um, whether that's the sound of a, the range of a sound of a bell or the range of Japanese knotweed, you know, we also like have been following the range of the emerald ash borer. You know, I'm right in the la within the last three years, I've gone from being outside of emerald ash borer to inside of emerald ash borer, and now it's moving up to Hardwick. Um, uh, and then the third way of thinking about uh, boundaries being uh, how we frame things, being like those cognitive categorical boundaries that we use uh, to organize and categorize things. So like, like with, uh, with the folk songs, uh, with the eugenics uh, project, that like creating archives and creating those categories um, is a way of setting boundaries and also like, uh, you know, can be a very dehumanizing and um, uh, yeah, exclusive way of, of setting boundaries. Um, do other people, uh, for this for this idea of how you learned the history of where where you live, any part of it? Well, I haven't learned the history of where I live because I don't think there is a the history. Yeah. Um, and you've helped remind me of that just by listening to the water and its story, um, rather than the thing we call history, which tends to focus on an anthropology centric mapping of person, human, species alone, separate yeah. from place. But I, I just, um, when you ask the question, how did you learn about the history of your place, I immediately went to, whose history? And, um, and you know, prehistory, I mean, here we are with categories again, even the question itself controls the way we experience your experience of listening to water <coughs> opened, it feels like it must have opened you up to all kinds of wonder beyond when the first colonial settler person found that, you know, discovered that part of the brook. Yeah, yeah. And I'm wondering what happened inside of you when you were, I'm going to turn the question around. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> what do you have inside of you? It's a you? Goddard trick. <laughs> <laughs> when you were just being present for listening as a person very attuned to sound, how you started experiencing, what started happening inside of you, what stories began to trickle through your <clears throat> consciousness at that point? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, one of the big takeaways is like the idea that listening is never innocent. You know what I mean? That you never like, you never open up to the point where you're not still organizing things uh, in terms of um, some frame of reference. You know what I mean? Um, and, you know, one of the things, so um, uh, just thinking about uh, you know, these questions about, um, y you know, histories and prehistories and, and that sort of thing. Uh, my, my dad is a geologist, and uh, he turned me on to a 2008 article that talked about just how many mills there were in the, uh, in the U.S., what is now the United States, on this continent, you know, um, by like 1800. Um, and that the shape of rivers um, at the time that the first sort of uh, like American cartographies of them and uh, hydrologies of them 
uh, that those stu that those first studies were done, they were already rivers that were like permanently reshaped by the presence of dams. So according to that article, which is mostly focusing on Virginia, but also like has estimates for how many dams there were, um, there would have been at least 70 dams in Washington County. Um, and so when you think about like how many places the same river is dammed to like for s how many mills, um, that like, I don't know, to me, um, the the idea you know the and with um uh the the folk song that's in there the um the land of beginning again the the idea that there isn't necessarily an access to a before you know what i mean um and so like we're always navigating our relationship to things how they are and that always involves yeah like like all of these histories are always in, in the in the pot, you know. Did you invite Bayard and, and Emmett into this? Because I'm just thinking how certain, how we're mostly all about what's going on in our heads. <laughs> the kids are often much more what's going on in their body and in their mm. environment. Mm. Um, did, did you spend time and, and talk with your dad about what he was doing and what and what is important for you here in in Vermont? Yeah. Well. Hmm. I li what I like about Vermont is mainly the um and um what I like mostly about Vermont is mainly the wildlife the and the like the how much wildlife there is in Vermont compared to some places and how much I don't know animals I mean we live in a place where last year there would be bears coming into our yard. <laughs> every day so i guess i really just like the nature of vermont mm. Mm. and i i look out my window from here and i often see bears walk across mm. the lawn and mama bear usually and babies it's, it's mm. beautiful to see thanks for that Emma. Mm. can i respond to the the boundary thing yeah yeah so i'm also a musician i'm a percussionist but um for me I was able to be taken away from boundaries through your piece and through the soundscapes that you created in the music, which maybe that's just akin to me and I'm biased because I'm a musician as well, but it was a sense of freedom that took me away from the colonialization and the counties and back to maybe what these sacred lands were like before white men came and raped and pillaged and created what we have here. Um, yeah, yeah. So that was special for me. It, it put me to sleep as well for a little while. Um, <laughs> Hopefully a good I sleep. Think it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So thank you. And uh, yeah, and I definitely think, you know, my interest in boundaries totally has to do with, y y you know, subverting them and interrupting them and yeah. puncturing them and, 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 and that sort of thing. The of the water of flowing freely and that water keeps going to other places and a sense of real freedom and yeah so that was special. and i love the fact i don't know for me like that that initial idea in the piece and the and the field recording that is then the source of most of the material in the piece um is that trickle of water that's leaking through an 1805 dam um and just the fact that like that little that that water like has been working on that project for you know over 200 years right. and yeah. i don't know i invited the i invited the head of the board of the robinson dam i didn't see him here but i invited him to the premiere but it was also like a kind of awkward thing for me too because it was like yes i'm featuring the dam mm -hmm. and also i'm kind of celebrating the thing that you're trying to repair <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, that yeah, that idea of the of the the thing that breaks through the boundary. Um, I was just following up on that. Are there any musical motifs or ideas in your piece that you saw as rivers that were flowing and going through the obstacles that you mentioned? That's interesting. I mean, in some ways, I think that um, the the score. The, you know, and there's some mention of this in the notes, uh, in the, that like, in some ways, 
um, writing the music is in a way like funneling it into a pen stock and making it operate a certain type of machinery, right? Oh. So like also just the mere act of taking these sounds and making something out of it is also like an extractive process um, that, yeah, that is complicit in this like settler colonial project that, that I'm like also taking that same trickle of water and like funneling it through my own flywheel, mm. you know what I mean? Mm. To like do my own, to, to mill my own lumber. Well, said that with the greatest structure, you have the greatest freedom. And so I felt like the structure that you created, I, and the, or, I told you about the parts, I recognize it, from, it threads through the whole piece, mm -hmm. allow what you're talking about to go beyond that. I mean, it's sort of a paradox perhaps, but, um, the fact that you put all this effort into the structure allows us to, to go through freely through all these obstacles. Yeah, and I think something that for me, um, uh, and this relates to, to what um, uh, to Suzanne's question as well, that like that the idea that listening is never innocent, also like to me, means that I don't necessarily need to aspire to like total freedom or total structurelessness or total like um, uh, distancing from, from those like categories that I'm using to organize things. But the more it's about like surfacing them and engaging with them critically, but also knowing that they're not going to go away. Uh, you know what I mean? And that, um, but like you can still think about them in terms of, you know, if you're thinking about them critically, you can think about whether or not you're doing harm, you know? Um, ontological harm, mm -hmm. um, but, I felt like yeah. your piece was the opposite, it was healing, I thought. Yeah. That's the goal, for sure, yeah. 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 And, uh, uh, yeah. yeah, did you raise your, yeah, I did. yeah. I yeah. My hand. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually have like, two things I want to say, two stories I want to say. Yeah, tell. please. One is about the town that I come from, which was originally settled in the hills two miles south of town, where um, the original settlers nearly mm -hmm. starved to death until they moved lock, stock, and barrel. They picked everything up and moved to what is now the center of Brandon and, and created a mill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's this sense of like <coughs> not listening to the landscape. Yeah, yeah. That is, they were going to, you know, punch it out in those hills that are, of course, complete. They're, they're bedrock. I mean, you cannot farm in those hills. It's out of the question, right? Yeah. And so only when they sort of learn some humility could they move into town and harness the power of, of the stream in order to make it town. So yeah. that's sort of one cautionary tale. And then another cautionary tale that I think is really important history for all of us Vermonters to know yeah. is that the man who is credited with discovering the headwaters of the Mississippi River is a man named Henry Rowe Schoolcraft, who is an early graduate of Newberry College, uh -huh. who was hired by then Lieutenant Territorial Governor Cass of Michigan to go on an excursion. He was the staff geologist uh -huh. hired to sort of figure out what to exploit. Yeah. He keeps a journal where he starts out completely racist towards mm -hmm. the Ojibwe uh, guides who are leading them. Um, they, they, they have to travel across New York prior, this is 1820, so it's before mm -hmm. the Erie Canal, mm -hmm. but they're able to take a steamboat from Buffalo mm. to Detroit, uh -huh. and then they get in a bunch of canoes and go up through Lake Superior and down looking for Lake for, for the headwaters of the Mississippi, mm -hmm. which they failed to find. But they managed to find the Mississippi eventually and go down the Mississippi for a while. And then the same guy, Henry Rose Schoolcraft, is hired to be the Indian agent for the whole upper territory. Mm -hmm. And he lives in Sault Ste. Marie, which is iced in in those days, over the winter. Mm -hmm. He teaches himself Ojibwe, but in the meantime marries an Ojibwe woman um, who 
and, and falls in love with the culture, the language. He, he writes these huge compilations of stories, mm. of native mm. stories. Mm -hmm. He completely becomes besotted with the culture. He's like as good a good guy as you can imagine in the early 19th century, right? And he means well for the native people. Mm -hmm. And he realizes, you know, settlement is coming. We got to do something. He basically invents the reservation system. Wow. In oh. Minnesota. Huh. And the way he does it, oh, and, and wow. this, I mean, for me, given also like how we dealt with enslaved people versus how we dealt with Native American people, basically we gave Native American families 100 acres. He just cut them up into rectangles. Mm -hmm. Talk about boundary. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and, and delivered each tr you know, tribal family mm -hmm. their own hundred acres to farm and said, here, you're all set now. Go to it. What he did not do is set it up on rivers yeah. so yeah. that these tribal groups mm -hmm. could not hang out with one another. Mm -hmm. They could not do their rituals, their, you know, powwows, like all the things that we know Native people do, right? Mm -hmm. They gather, they party, they exchange gifts, they do the stuff that's really, really important to the culture. Mm -hmm. So I considered a project called Friends Like These mm -hmm. because this guy is the model of a well-meaning liberal white guy, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Totally getting it wrong. I mean, like so deeply and profoundly getting it wrong. Mm. But in the meantime, his brother-in-law took him to the headwaters of the Mississippi, which is why he is credited with this. Wow. Wow. So. Wow. <laughs> um, and that reminds me of, so Tobin, who's had to leave, but I wish he was here because he could speak to this better than I can, but he said that when Vermont was first uh, parceled up for sale, it was similarly like grid, you know, like uh, done on, on a grid system and bought and sold by people who had never been, uh, you know, who had never uh, been to this territory, right? It's kind of like what's happening now with people from New York and California yeah. buying like Yeah, yeah, and, and because of that, people didn't know what they were getting, so they would buy like three non-adjacent parcels to increase the likelihood that one of those parcels would be farmable land. Because um, they didn't, you know, there was, they knew, knew nothing about the topography, and that made, that, I thought about that when you were talking about Brandon and people like moving to, um, of will. Right. <laughs> this is where we are. We're going to make it work. Um, and then the, what, what you mentioned about the sawmill and Brandon, too, uh, a story that didn't make it into this piece, but that uh, came up um, is the, there's a, a sawmill. There was a sawmill on the Missisquoi River. Um, and this is one of the only actual agreements between the Abenaki and settlers is a French settler um, got permission to build a sawmill there from the uh, Missisquoi Abenaki. Um, but because there was a French sawmill on the Missisquoi River, when the British took over that sawmill, they considered all of that French land. Right. And so the presence of that one mill meant that the British didn't interact with the Abenaki at all, but said, this is already French land, we've claimed it in the Seven Years' War, you know, from the French. Um, so it's just, to me, it's like one of those ways that like this one structure then changed the status of that land within the eyes of those two states and made it possible for the Abenaki to be completely uh, left out of those conversations about land, even when the British were negotiating with the Haudenosaunee. You know what I mean? Um, and the only thing I'm adding is to this sort of brilliant sort of structural exposition, which is the way I, when you and I talk, I'm often thinking, is what are the ideas that in values and generational pasts that have shaped these decisions and these outlooks? So it's obviously all about whatever words you want to use, white supremacy, imperialist ways. There's a, there's a profound ideology that's making it very easy to set up these systems, because after all, they're designed to help people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not and designed to help people who aren't even really people. 
there's something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just having memories of listening to a Penobscot teacher talk about um, the coming of early settlers and the belief system and the structures in England and elsewhere that um, everything that was discovered here is under the ownership of the European colonists. And mm -hmm. so um, that kind of the, the history was written onto the land before the people even got here from Europeans mm -hmm. who already knew that the whole thing was about um, the manifest destiny of the church of multiple colonies, you know, mm -hmm. multiple colonies um, that came, multiple groups that came here to settle colonies. And one of the things that happened to indigenous understanding Understanding of relationship to place, which I'll call relationship to place instead of history, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is that um, it was collective membership of place, ownership. There was no s ownership was a foreign concept mm -hmm. until they, until people, First Nation uh, Indigenous people, were disowned and disinherited. So then, when Native people were forcibly relocated and given Parcels, that was also foreign, and that it was actually what what destroyed the heart of that collective, collaborative membership of place. Mm -hmm. Human membership to place was the relational dynamic. Humans were members of of the, the odyssey of, of creation, and were caregivers and care ta and taken by creation. And there was inter. It was a very different story, as my Penobscot teacher friend says. Mm -hmm. Cherry Mitchell. Cherry Mitchell, yeah. I, I guess, was guessing that that was and, who you're talking about. You know, about. we studied um, the history of colonization through a Penobscot lens with her recently. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> she said it's when First Nation people were divided into parcels, like these grids, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that was the breakdown of tribal identity. Mm -hmm. That was the beginning of, mm -hmm. for her, that was one of the greatest deepest woundings yeah. of colonization was giving people independent pieces. <laughs> because before it was whole place and whole people in whole place. And then colonization created yeah. insanity. Uh, Separatism. Mm -hmm. your, your structure begged the larger question, which was there are ways of charting Mm -hmm. History in place on paper, on books, by bells. Mm -hmm. And when so many other cultures chronicled by stories mm -hmm. that weren't on paper, that were passed from generation to generation, yeah. that, in, that the stories themselves were wrapped around the landscape in yeah. which they lived. And the wampum. Well, whatever, okay. depending on, yeah, depending yeah, pretty, on the, on pretty, the uh, pretty, pretty one, of, one of the things I was talking with uh, my daughter who's um, in, uh, up on the northwest coast, I don't know if she's, but, and she's uh, working with Quigel, and um, her, I'm going to say it's like a sister-in-law for her, who's an mm -hmm. expert, is saying sometimes people, when we, we talk about Native cultures, it's as if they're all the same. And I know that you know, none of us do this initially mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. with intention. And that's, that's sort of like the gentleman who said, oh, oh, I'll save the folks, I'll make a reservation. But it's this business of the sound. The sound is specific to a place. The people are, are specific, the resources. Yeah. And you know, when that, in a way, is foreign to how we grew up and how we experience and interact with the world at large. So I just wanted to thank you for the, the framing of, of your composition, because if you look at it and you listen to it, it just recalls.
yeah, is like, um, it's a worldview, you know, you know? Um, and, and so I, yeah, I do think that there's something about, about the specific and the local and the immediate and the like, you can touch it and hear it and interact with it yourself and put your body there and not say that that's like an experience that relates to, you know, to, to every sawmill or every river or every, you know what I mean? But just like yeah. the, the particular place where you can put your feet in the water, you know? I think that is, that's an important point. There's also um, a current student um, that I'm working with. There's lots of Goddard people here, so there's lots of Goddard talk, but uh, um, uh, is writing about the fact that like, because the migration of species is like an essential um, survival uh, ability, a survival tactic, right? Like that trees, the range of trees move, the range of squirrels move, the, you know, that, that ticks. the, yeah, ticks. <laughs> um, but that b sure. because migration is um, like an essential tactic of resilience yeah. and because colonization is essentially about the fragmentation of place into property for the purposes of extraction, that like, if we want to talk about um, sustainability studies, we need to talk about this underlying like rejection of the colonial state and of the like this thing that is built all about fragmentation because that that ecosystem fragmentation is also what keeps plants and animals from being able to engage in the types of migration that are going to make climate change survivable. You know, even yeah. And that was going to be my question to you. Is like, so what? Like, um, well, first I just want to say, man, it's like, um, I just remember when the nail fiddles first came out. <laughs> it was just like so play. It was like, like just this really playful. Like you talk about like Emmett, right? And it's like that spirit of playfulness and curiosity and inquiry. Like just to see it coming away in this. I'm just like. I'm, it's like so beautiful, and like I, you know, my brother's a music composer, so like I've been to a couple of these, and I just gotta say that like I love how you didn't avoid and were so candid with your own contradiction of confronting these things and documenting it with time in a demarcated space. I love that it occurred in a space not only with the birds but with the highway. It was, it was, it was just, it was candid. And and real and and it, it it didn't it didn't try to uh, have some facsimile of like a solution. It really asked questions. And I'm getting to my question. <laughs> but, like I just I just loved it. I really I really did love it. Um, and so I think one of the questions that I'm sort of like coming out from this, and I want to know your sort of piece on that is like what does what does it mean for you? To look at, uh, I can't remember the post, you know, with no future already, I can't remember exactly the whole thing. But it's like, what does it mean to like live in a post-colonial piece? What does it mean for you personally, dealing with these contradictions, to think of, to think in a post-colonial way? I think that's a terrific question. I don't, I don't have, you know. As, as you mentioned in terms of like not, not acting as though one has the answers, I'm not going to. But, um, but I do think, so you know, one thing that I was thinking about on July 4th, which was not too long ago, right? Um, uh, and this was a new thing for me, and I, but, but like the idea of not thinking about the United States from a perspective of like good or bad, you know, sort of thing, but thinking of the United States making the shift from thinking of it as permanent to thinking of it as temporary, right? And if you think about the United States as a temporary project, you know what I mean? One that, like, that if we just, because we do, we, you know, whatever, in the abstract, everything is temporary, right? But, like, if we lean into the idea that, like, this state is a, is a temporary thing that had a beginning and will have an end, you know, and then think... Uh, about like how do you participate in how how do you how do you engage with and participate in a state 
with the idea in mind of bringing it to, a, to an end that causes the least harm and moves on to, the, to a good next thing instead of a bad next thing. You know what I mean? I do, and you can apply that to your own thoughts as well, that, that we can colonize. Yeah, I mean, I don't think, you know, I think, I, I think that decolonization is a multi-generational thing. You know what I mean? So I, I think for, for me, um, uh, and, and of course, you know, um, uh, Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Yang's decolonization is not a metaphor is a great source for, um, uh, but, you know, one of the things that they talk a lot about is settler moves to innocence, all the ways that settlers try to do things to, f to, to make themselves innocent or to make themselves feel innocent, right? Um, and so, like, acknowledging that innocence is not an achievable thing in my lifetime. I thought the piece addressed that. I thought it was so great. I mean, I just thought it was great. Well, thank and you. Answer, answer, mm -hmm. I love the interpretation of the lab. It was just it was yeah. wonderful. <laughs> Otherwise, I was just going to say ever so quickly, I, this strikes me of conversations that we've all had for decades, which is... How do we, on the one hand, build Vermont into a place of natural beauty and greater justice and greater diversity, among other qualities? Um, but then how do we m make sure it's not an enclave state? Yeah. yeah. And, and what, are, what are my obligations to people in Boston? What are my obligations to people on the coast? What are my obligations to people in any number of different locales? So there's there's really important questions that a beautiful thing like this spurs us to ask and think about how does, I, I spent time with Middlebury students one day and they talked about all their senior studies and they were brilliant senior studies and then I just said to them at the end, what are you going to do differently now that you've done this beautiful yeah, senior yeah. study? And they looked at me like, what? <laughs> really? You know, that was a new question for them. But here, forgive me, at Goddard, we're really actively asking that all the time. What, how does this change us? What, what, what does this do? We'll, we'll all be watching you and your family. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you all for coming to the piece and also oh, for you. sticking around for this conversation. Yeah, it's all um, wonderful. Will yeah. there be a second uh, coming of the piece? I'd like. I